Hey everyone, um, this is going to be a lecture on uh, glycolysis, chapter 22. We're going to do this in sections. So this first section will just cover specifically the metabolism of glucose. So um, I just wanted to point out, obviously, carbohydrate metabolism, glycolysis, glucose is really important. It's the major um, source of kind of it's, it's the major molecule that our body uses to create energy, uh, ATP from glucose. So faulty storage, faulty metabolism, faulty breakdown of glucose, um, it, there can be many different ways it can be faulty, but one of the ways is if you have issues with insulin, a way we store glucose in the body, and that can end up in type 1 diabetes. And so there's just some facts here that you can read. The one I think is just the craziest outside of the number of people that it affects is that it can be triggered by anything, any virus, a cold, your regular um, cold virus, and it can happen, it happens in a lot of children is how they find out. So um, yeah, that's one of the ways it can go wrong. But let's look at uh, this map, which you saw in chapter 21, and I just wanna orient us again. So in chapter 21, we talked about stage three and stage four the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. Um, we're gonna be up here in stage two, okay, where glycolysis happens. And reminder that you end up making pyruvate and then pyruvate is immediately uh, converted into acetyl-CoA, which is immediately um, your initial substrate for the citric acid cycle. So this all ties together and I just wanted to remind you of how. <coughs> all right. Um, I'm going to read these statements over here on the side, and then I want to look at this chart, this kind of figure. Um, so when energy is needed in the body, this is when glycolysis happens. Glucose is metabolized to pyruvate via glycolysis, and then everything shuffles down into the citric acid cycle and ultimately the electron transport chain to make ATP. And so that's when we need energy. But we don't always need energy. Sometimes we have a good amount of energy, and when energy is not needed, uh, glucose... Uh, is not going to be run through glycolysis. So what do we do with it? Um, glucose can be converted to glycogen. We can store it. So our body does not store ATP, but we can store glucose. Um, this happens through a process called glycogenesis, um, or it can be converted to fatty acids as well. And then you also have this pentose phosphate pathway, which could also convert glucose to NADPH um, and kind of is ultimately ends up as a precursor for nucleic acids. All right. So <clears throat> um, we'll come back to that last blank in just a second. I want you to look at this chart. I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit. Obviously, you can see the citric acid cycle at the bottom. Up top here is when glucose enters the bloodstream, what happens to it? So first off, I want to say, if I were you, I would take some time to be very familiar with this graph and this, um, well, it's not really a graph, but this figure. Um, because I think it will just help orient you. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about um, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, okay, which are these processes over here, how we make and break down glycogen. We're going to talk about glycolysis, and notice all these words kind of sound the same. Um, and so if you'll spend some time studying this, it will help orient you as to how all these things relate in metabolism. Um, and then I want to point out, too, that any words, like, let's look at how we can help differentiate these words. Um, so in glucose, um, becomes phosphorylated in the cell to glucose 6-phosphate. It runs through the process of glycolysis. If you'll notice, we can break this up into two words, glyco meaning glycogen, or sorry, um, uh, glucose, and then lysis means to break down. Okay, so you'll commonly notice either lysis or genesis at the end of these words. So if the ending of the word is lysis, this is um, a catabolic process. I'm going to write that. Okay, remember catab uh, catabolism breaks things down into smaller molecules, um, but if it's a genesis type of process, like gluconeogenesis, then it is anabolism. It's an anabolic process in the body, okay? So anything that's blue is anabolic. Anything that's a tan, brownish colored arrow is catabolic. So that's uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are the opposite of each other. Glycolysis breaks down glucose, gluconeogenesis um, makes glucose, but not, um, but, but out of things already in the body. So we can use um, amino acids, so we can use glycerol, 
and ultimately make glucose if we're not getting it from our diet from other biological molecules in the body. Um, and then glycogenesis is how we make glycogen for storing glucose. Glycogenolysis is what happens when we break down glycogen so that we can dump glucose into our bloodstream. Um, we're also gonna talk about this transition right down here. When we take pyruvate, what happens under anaerobic, which means no oxygen versus aerobic conditions when we do have oxygen. So spend some time studying this figure, get familiar with it. Um, we will cover these portions, lipid metabolism, protein metabolism, in a different chapter. So um, I think it's good to know that you use acetyl-CoA to convert it into other things, um, but we're not going to really talk about those in this chapter. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, oh, this word down here um, is gluconeogenesis. Right, so this is when we can take non-carbohydrate sources such as amino acids, glycerol, which is derived from um, triacylglycerols, fatty acids, and um, we use those sources to make glucose. So we're creating, genesis is like creation, creating glucose from non-carb sources. Okay, um, let's get into the process of glycolysis. So I'm just, this slide is an overview, and then the next slide is where we're really going to dig in. So this is the biochemical pathway that breaks glucose down into 2-pyruvate, um, 2-NADH, and overall you get 2-ATP. So these are the net yields of glycolysis. Um, we're gonna talk about it in two overall parts. So you have steps one through five, there's 10 steps total. So the, the first half is, is known as your energy investment um, steps. These are the first five steps. And so it's gonna require an investment of ATP in these first five uh, steps, not in every single step, but in a couple steps. And then we will um, produce ATP in the back half of glycolysis, step six through 10. Okay, so because um, glucose ultimately, halfway through at step five, will be split into two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So this happens again, halfway through glycolysis, and then step six through 10 happen uh, times two. Okay, so each, each glyceraldehyde three phosphate is then um, metabolized the same way. So these steps, steps six through 10, happen twice per one molecule of glucose. All right, so if you see this here, glucose ultimately is broken down into glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Um, these first steps, one through five, um, require two ATP. And then because each glyceraldehyde three phosphate is converted into its own pyruvate and each one generates two ATP, the overall net yield of ATP is just two. We, we had to pay two and then we get four back. So the overall net yield is just two ATP. Um, all right, let's look at the steps. So before we get into some of this, I realize some of it's kind of blurry if you zoom in. So I'm sorry for that. I think it's still a really great figure. The text is just not perfectly clear. So um, here's the deal. I'm just going to be very forward with you guys. You're going to have to know... Um, all the enzymes and all the metabolite names for the first half of glycolysis, okay? You will not have to know um, the enzymes and metabolite names for steps 6 through 10, okay? So make a note of that. If you're listening right now, write that down. Memorize, know every enzyme for steps 1 through 5, and know the metabolite names, meaning... Um, what glucose is converted into, okay, the glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, those things. And then we are also going to talk about how glycolysis is regulated, just like we did with the citric acid cycle. So I want you to know any um, activators, allosteric activators, or inhibitors for any of these enzymes. I want you to know those things. So how we regulate glycolysis, um, know all the enzymes for steps 1 through 5, know all the metabolite names for steps 1 through 5. All right? Um, so let's, let's get into it. We're going to start right up here with glucose, and this is the first molecule. The first step is when we uh, glucose comes into the cell, 
uh, we phosphorylate it. And so that is done by a enzyme called hexokinase. And if you guys can't read this, I'm actually going to, let me take a second and color over this. I'm going to write it more clearly. Hexokinase. And we know what a kinase is now because we've studied enzymes. It's a enzyme that phosphorylates. So we require one ATP. You can see that um, right down here. We're going to take one ATP, break the phosphate group off, and where does it go? It gets put on to carbon number six, which is why we call it glucose six phosphate because that phosphate group is now attached to carbon six. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, you will not. Ha you do not have to know how to draw all these things. So you don't have to draw the metabolites. Just know how to name them. Um, but you're not going to have to draw them. All right, this next one, uh, step two, phosphoglucose isomerase is the enzyme. And I'm going to rewrite this. This is annoying me. Phosphoglucose isomerase. So write that down. And it just converts glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. No ATP required. Um, we're just creating an isomer um, so that we can get ready to actually phosphorylate fructose 6-phosphate. In the next step, step three, um, we're going to add, uh, it's going to require another ATP. I like to do that in red. So we're going to take the phosphate group ATP, and now we're going to put it onto carbon one. So now we have two phosphate groups right there on carbon six and carbon one. Um, I'm just going to write the phosphofructokinase. So I wish I could just erase this, but I can't. Phosphofructokinase. All right, is the enzyme that does this. Again, it's a kinase, so we're, that indicates that we're phosphorylating something. And so the metabolite name is fructose. 1,6-bisphosphate. So I'm going to highlight all the metabolite names. I bet you can see it if I do it in purple. Glucose becomes glucose 6-phosphate, becomes fructose 6-phosphate, an isomer of glucose 6-phosphate. And then we phosphorylate again to get fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then we break it in half. Okay, so the enzyme that does this is called aldolase. And what we're going to do is we're going to chop this guy in half, and we end up with um, two molecules. One is useful for steps 6 through 10, and one is not useful. Um, so let me highlight these. Oh, wait, we're already purple. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's the useful um, metabolite here, and that's the one that's going to go on through the next steps of glycolysis. But we also make dihydroxyacetone phosphate dihydroxy that's a long name dihydroxyacetone phosphate and so we abbreviate it as d h dihydroxy a p acetone phosphate and um we're gonna have the last enzyme that you need to know is this triose phosphate isomerase i'm gonna rewrite that so you can see it more clearly triose phosphate isomerase because all we do is we take DHAP and we convert it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We don't lose any atoms. We just shuffle some stuff around. And um, once we have glycerol two molecules, so we end up with, I'm going to say times two. We end up with two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. And so remember, step six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all these are going to happen twice for every one molecule of glucose. Right, which is why we end up with times two pyruvate. So if it just helps you, just write a times two over here under steps six through ten. All right, now um, you do not need to know any of the delta G stuff. Okay, you don't have to worry about any of that. But again, know these enzymes, know the metabolite names that we've highlighted in purple or highlighted in purple. Um, the last things I want to say, I'm not going to walk through steps six through ten as in depth. Um, naming all the enzymes, but I do want to just give you the overall rundown of what happens. Right um, after step five, so we've got two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to phosphorylate. Notice that we've got this phosphate group right here on this carbon. We're going to phosphorylate this one right up here, 
okay? So we're gonna, we have this phosphate group and it's gonna require a coenzyme. We're gonna reduce a coenzyme. It's the only step in glycolysis where we reduce a coenzyme to make NADH. Um, but through the reduction of that coenzyme, we are going to add, now we have two phosphate groups. So we get one three bisphosphoglycerate. And then that phosphate group is gonna immediately be used to make ATP. So we're gonna put it on to the carbon to make one three bisphosphoglycerate. And we're gonna rip it right back off to generate an ATP. This is the first step where uh, first energy generation step. Okay, so steps one and three require an ATP. Step seven, we don't get any energy back until we get to step seven. Then we make one ATP. And um, that other, so this phosphate group is gonna be gone. And then we're also gonna get rid of this phosphate group down here in step 10. That phosphate group is gonna jump on and make another ATP. And we're gonna be left with um, pyruvate. Okay, so um, that's the overall rundown of glycolysis. Um, if you have any questions, again, about what you need to know and what I expect from this and what you don't need to know, um, shoot me an email, write down your question right now, pause the video and write down your questions. But um, know the enzyme names, which is why I rewrote them so those were more clear. Know the metabolite names we highlighted in purple um, for steps one through five. And then um, the overall net yields like we talked about up here. Okay, so... Oh, um, how do you regulate glycolysis? So we've actually already talked about one example with hexokinase, you may remember. Um, I use it as an example when we talked about enzymes, but glucose 6-phosphate, this, um, it's the first product in glycolysis after step one. Glucose 6-phosphate actually acts as an inhibitor, and we indicate that by putting this little um, kind of line like this. So I'm gonna write G6P, is an inhibitor to hexokinase. It shuts hexokinase off. So if we do, if the body does not need to run glycolysis, we can stop it pretty early um, versus making all these metabolites, investing all this energy and wasting ATP. Um, glucose 6-phosphate um, is an inhibitor to hexokinase. So that's one way we uh, regulate glycolysis. Another way we regulate glycolysis is down here in step three. So not much further down, but phosphofructokinase, there's some activators and some inhibitors. Okay, so what activates phosphofructokinase? What turns the enzyme on so that it function at full functions at full capacity? AMP and AD. You know what? I'm going to write these in green so that you might... Green means go, right? So AMP, ADP. These... Um, when you draw an arrow, usually that indicates, okay, it's going to make the enzyme go. It's going to turn it on. AMP and ADP is um, like the cousin's ATP. It's instead of a triphosphate, it's adenosine monophosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Okay. So um, these are, and, and we have a lot of AMP and a lot of ADP when the body's low in energy. When we have been utilizing ATP phosphor or dephosphorylating ATP to make other reactions happen, because remember, the, the dephosphorylation of ATP is very energetically favorable. It releases 7.3 kcal of energy, and that energy is used to power other reactions. So if we've been using a lot of ATP, then we're going to have a lot of AMP and ADP left over in the body. And that's an indicator to the body, hey, we need to run glycolysis. We need more ATP, so metabolize some glucose so that we can run the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. All right? Now, if we have plenty of... Uh, ATP, guess what? ATP itself is an inhibitor to phosphofructokinase. We've got plenty of ATP, so we don't need to make any more. So ATP itself is an inhibitor um, to phosphofructokinase. And then also citrate. You guys remember where we uh, encounter citrate? Citrate is once you have um, acetyl-CoA is your first like incoming substrate to the citric acid cycle, citrate is what you make from acetyl-CoA. It's the first thing that you make. It's the first product of the citric acid cycle. So maybe make a note to yourself there. This is found in the citric acid cycle. Citrate and ATP um, are negative 
inhibitors, okay, they turn off phosphofructokinase, A AMP and ADP are positive um, regulators, they turn on phosphofructokinase, and those are the things that I want you to know about regulation of glycolysis. Notice that all of these regulatory steps happen within the first three steps. That way, again, the body doesn't run glycolysis halfway through or over halfway through and waste a bunch of energy and time and resources making pyruvate when we don't need more pyruvate. All right, um, so let's step down here. Let's see what happens. What's the fate of pyruvate after glycolysis? So remember, uh, well, before I say remember, um, it depends what condition we have. An aerobic oxidation of pyruvate, so when we have good supplies of oxygen, um, pyruvate moves from the cytosol of the cell into the mitochondria. Okay, remember that mitochondria was like that bean-shaped organelle. This is where the citric acid cycle happens inside the mitochondria. This is also where electron transport happens and you make ATP, okay, is all inside the mitochondria. All right, so um, glycolysis is happening in the cell. So here's your cell, but it's happening out in the cytosol. All right, so pyruvate is gonna move from the cytosol into your mitochondria. And um, it goes across both membranes. Remember, there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. It goes all the way into the matrix. And in the mitochondrial matrix, pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to convert, convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA so that the citric acid cycle is set up to go. And look, look, look what it requires, NAD+, a coenzyme. So we're going to reduce a coenzyme. into NADH plus. Um, and then we get, end up with acetyl-CoA. So what's happening here is we're kind of um, chopping off this carbon and two oxygens, and that's where we get CO2 from. And then this acetyl group, so what I'm about to highlight, this is an acetyl group, becomes the acetyl part of coenzyme A, right? Uh, now, reminder, I'm going to say this 100 times. This is happening times two. This whole thing is happening times two because at the end of glycolysis, you end up with two pyruvate, right? So we're going to reduce two coenzymes. So we'll get two NADH out of this, one for each pyruvate. Okay, but what about um, anaerobic conditions? Okay, so in anaerobic So where do we have anaerobic conditions? Well, your red blood cells, they actually don't contain mitochondria. Oh no, they don't even run electron transport and they don't run the citric acid cycle. They don't make ATP that way. So how in the world do our red blood cells do anything? Um, well, we're about to figure that out. And then your muscle tissue contains a low supply of oxygen, okay, which is necessary for both, um, or for electron transport, okay? Um, so how do these cells and tissues generate energy if they don't have mitochondria or if they have a low supply of oxygen? And what happens is pyruvate is going to be converted into lactate. So what it's showing you here is that you have a carbon-oxygen double bond on this carbon and pyruvate. We're going to take NADH. We're going to oxidize it, the enzyme, or the, sorry, the coenzyme. And um, we're going to take these hydrogens, I'm going to highlight on this one and this one, and these are going to become the hydrogens right here. Okay, that were on NADH, and now they are um, on lactate. And when we do this, we regenerate NAD+, okay? So keep your eye on this guy. We really... Um, regenerate NAD+. And remember, this happens times two, which is why if you slide over to this graph, you see all these little twos, okay? Because for every one molecule of glucose, we make two pyruvate. So let's orient ourselves to see how we make ATP under anaerobic conditions, how we continuously make it. So glucose makes like a glycolysis, and we know that it's in steps um, seven and in steps 10 that we make ATP, all right? So we need NAD, um, this happens in step six. We need NAD plus for step six of glycolysis. In step six of glycolysis, that's where we reduce NAD plus to NADH. So if we run out of NAD, 
NADH, we cannot run glycolysis in these cells anymore. So the reason um, that this all is allowed to happen to keep generating ATP and keep these cells running, pyruvate uses NADH, we oxidize it back to NAD, so we're recycling. Your body is so sustainable. We're recycling um, this NAD+. Plus. So we make lactate out of that, but ultimately we get NAD+, plus, which just comes right back around and helps us run step six of glycolysis so that we can whoop, make more ATP, okay? Um, so that's how these red blood cells, your muscle tissue, um, produce ATP is straight from glycolysis, all right? Now, we have talked a whole lot about glycolysis. Let's figure out how much energy we get. Um, we talked about when we, uh, sorry, when we did citric acid cycle and electron transport. Remember, we figured out how many ATP you can make from NADH and FADH2. So my question here is how many molecules of ATP are produced from one molecule of glucose in the body? So the, to do this, there's a couple steps. First, determine the number of NADH total. And I have these highlighted for you. From glycolysis, we get these things. 2 NADH, 2 ATP. All right. From the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we get two, 2 more NADH. No ATP there, but 2 more NADH. And then we already know from the citric acid cycle, we get these things. And why is it 6 and 2 and 2? Um, that's because for every one molecule of glucose, we make two pyruvate, and we would make two acetyl-CoA, which would be able to generate two cranks of the citric acid cycle, um, or two full completions of it. So that's why all the numbers are doubled. So if we add these things up, total we get 10 NADH2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10. We have a total of 2 FADH. All right, so um, let's figure out how many... ATP we get. So we would want to do 10 times 2.5, which is 25. Then we have, uh, that's for NADH2, FADH2 times 1.5 is going to give us three more. And then remember, you have four ATP, two produced in glycolysis, a net yield of two. And because um, we're going to be able to run the citric acid cycle twice for each molecule of glucose, we produce two more ATP there. So that is a total of four more. ATP, this is all ATP now. So if you add all this up, it should get a, be a total of 32 ATP from one glucose. All right, so that's gonna end this portion of the lecture and we'll pick up with um, more regulation of glucose metabolism in the next part.